Collaborations between clinicians, researchers and patients working together is vital, fitting all the jigsaw pieces together. And I truly believe we're so, so close. And I'd like to start by saying thank you to all of you for your passion, your drive, your endless motivation in helping us, because together we will beat this. It gives me the same never-ending hope that the late, great Tom Isaacs had. In his words, one day we will say we used to have Parkinson's. So who am I? Well, these days I'm not too sure, but I do know I'm proud to be an advocate for the Cure Parkinson's Trust. I'm passionate about raising awareness and improving parky life for all. I'm an extremely impatient patient. I've been living with Parkinson's since 2004, when I was 32. Officially diagnosed and on med since 2007, my egg timer is now running out fast, and I've had enough, quite frankly. My life is dictated by endless pill popping, which may or may not be effective. If I'm lucky, it allows me to function at some level for some of the time. Often like a bull in a china shop, cannoning off people and furniture. Dyskinesia is awful, and it's like being taken over by a poltergeist. It's embarrassing and exhausting on a good day, and life-threatening and dangerous on a bad one. Getting the right balance of drugs in our systems is a daily experiment of its own. Too little, and I'm incapacitated with agonising dystonia. Too much, and I'm river dancing badly and gurning like Les Dawson. And it does nothing for my street cred. So, we really need better therapies without hideous side, side effects. It's long overdue. I consider myself well informed and empowered, but despite this, it's still a living hell. Clinical trials are our only hope, yet we're still missing out on possible contenders for the cure. And frustration doesn't even begin to come close. So today I'm here to talk about clinical trials from the patient perspective and possible solutions to barriers in regards to recruitment and retainment. I also want to highlight the need for better support during and post-trial where necessary. I'm well aware of this need as I have been that patient left reeling. As it stands, 10 million people worldwide are living with Parkinson's, 127,000 in the UK alone, two patients newly diagnosed every hour, that figure is rising and that pa pandemic is expected. Patients are getting younger and it's terrifying and the need for urgency is now. A more actively involved patient population is essential in clinical trials. And trials aren't something that should be done on patients, but rather it should be done with patients. Our involvement provides insight into more than just the scientific effects or results of a specific, specific treatment. They provide information on how to improve quality of life. A more patient-centred approach translates to a patient gaining a more active role in healthcare systems. It takes into account the need and values of the individual, and this is a shift that should be embraced within the clinical trials arena. Thankfully, the collaboration of experts forming the critical path for Parkinson's has taken this on board. But why is this not filtered down and kicked patients into action? Clinical trials, like I said, are the only way to bring better treatments to patients, and that is what we patients are all shouting for. Yet only 10% of patients with Parkinson's actively participate in clinical trials, and I just don't get this. It, we, it seems, are failing ourselves. Research carried out by Parkinson's Movement, which is an international patient group created by Q Parkinson's Trust, published back in 2015, looked at the main barriers and cited a number of reasons why patients didn't participate. More than 56% cited adverse consequences consequences and potential side effects is the most concerning barrier. What, and the drugs that we already have don't do that? 54% worried about disruption to normal medication regime. Again, words fail me. Other barriers included receiving a placebo instead of the trial drug. Yeah, that's the way it goes. And the upheaval and inconvenience to life that a trial would cause. The fifth most common concern was not being kept fully informed of both the trial progress and results. This may seem to show a complete lack of altruism and foresight and, dare I say, selfishness. Yeah, I do dare. As a patient who's had the pleasure of plumbing installed into my brain as part of a trial, and then again only four weeks ago removed, I'm of the opinion that I have faith, hope and trust and will do whatever it takes. While looking at research on trials, I found this cancer patient quote, I survived because of those who came before me. I live because of the research performed by others, often funded by the generosity of the American people. But the generosity is beyond their tax dollars supporting research. I live because others participated in clinical trials that may not have helped them. 
By volunteering for clinical research, they help push back the unknown and shed light upon the darkness of the undiscovered. Perfect words, I felt. Personally, I believe the problem lies more with patients not knowing about trials rather than them saying no. In nearly 12 years of being a Parkinson's patient, I have never once been offered a Parkinson's, a Parkinson's clinical trial. Yes, I've been on one, but that was my own doing. I got myself onto the recent GDNF trial in Bristol through luck, cheek, and daring to ring up and ask. Many patients wouldn't dream of doing that, and my bravado was purely repinerol driven <laughs> It may be necessary to actively go and speak to patients across the board. We want a cross-section of patients and the appropriate ones doing the appropriate trials. Not just motivated, social media savvy ones. I believe there's a large untapped group of patients on whose door we need to knock. Try and turn the pages over when you park your fire, that's great. Also, oh, there's a missing page, hang on. <laughs> Okay, I think these patients would only be too happy to help if they knew. I feel passionately we have a duty of care to spur research on and to do our bit, not only for our fellow Parkies suffering today, but those yet to come, as it may be one of our nearest and dearest. Trials are lengthy and costly, and sadly so much money is wasted due to poor recruitment. The lack of patients being recruited is one of the main reasons slowing and hampering trials and therapies. But do patients actually know this? 85% of trials f started faced lengthy delays and 30% never even got off the ground due to failed recruitment. And this is after investors and researchers have spent vast amounts of money and energy and time getting to this point. It's shameful, I feel, and causing investors to take their money elsewhere. This highlights the need to educate patients about how much we need their involvement. There's also a need to look at written information that we're given to patients. It needs to be patient and carer friendly. Yes, many patients are well informed, but the majority are not really medically trained. It needs to be easily understandable. Handing over information that's full of medical jargon can be overwhelming and scary. It needs to take into account all family members, including children, as being on a trial affects not just the patient. The others in, in our families need support too. It must have been terrifying when I think back to my own GDNF journey as I merrily skipped to theatre, so happy, oblivious to the needs of those around me, I'm ashamed to say. So who do I think is the best person, people to recruit? I believe former trial patients could be a valuable asset. It could actually benefit both past and present trialees by positively affecting their mental health. The notion they're actively being proactive in fighting giving patients back the sense of control which is often lost in chronic illness. Apathy, depression and stress affects us so negatively, but positive mental attitude is healing. So let's train trial bodies and pay them too. It would be vital work and we could be so effective in developing a support, support programme to holistically guide patients through the trial process. Again, looking at my own experience, I totally underestimated the physical, mental and emotional toll it took on me, not just on me, but also my friends and family. I actually ended up moving out of the family home for a year, but fortunately received counselling. I am not alone in feeling overwhelmed. We need to look at counselling services pre, during and most importantly, post end of trial. Patients need to feel need closure in order to move forward, especially when a trial ends and the treatment was helping them. We need to feel valued, not merely as lab rats, no longer of any use. And remember, being on a trial rules us out of being on lots of other trials. We are deemed as not clean. <laughs> Retainment also is a huge issue, and again, we need to look at why patients drop out. Speaking, from speaking to fellow trial participants, it's not because they lose interest or simply don't care. The issues lie with practicalities that could easily be sorted. One patient told me the logistics of travelling every month 650 miles round trip, often alone, was a nightmare, especially as they were often without medication for assessment. Not everybody has family and friends who can take time out to support them. And sadly, people with Parkinson's are renowned for putting on a brave face and not always asking for help. There is a distinct need to act tough that I may have Parkinson's, but it ain't got me, is my biggest bugbear. The need to swim over open waters and climb mountains only exacerbates the need to appear to be a super patient. It's time this was stopped, as it puts unnecessary pressure on patients. 
We need to know it's okay to feel frightened and ask for help. I also feel patients should be paid to be on a trial. If we are to be seen as a, vital, a valued member of a trial, then treat us equally. Financial issues are another cause of trial dropout. Being away from home is not cheap, and expenses do, simply do not cover it costs. Personally, money has always been an issue since leaving work, coupled with the fact that Rapinarol gave me a huge appetite for spending money. But as someone self-employed, taking time out, not just for two days a month for assessment and treatment, but often if I felt unwell for a few more days, meant that I lost a lot of work. Add this up over five years. Paying patients and allowing them to remain on a trial would actually save money in the long run. Patients are the key to solving this puzzle. Treat them right and they will be loyal to the end. Lessons must be learnt. I believe we are slowly fighting this battle, but united we will win this war quicker. Thank you for listening. So that's, um, that's a thumbs down for Rapinarol then. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, GDN Just GDNF study has been accepted for publication in Brain, so it will be yes. out soon. Um, so, hope, and therefore, the Channel Four documentary will air shortly afterwards. I think BBC Two. Oh, BBC Two is it? I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's Thank the you. BBC, yes. Yes. Um, so that's going to be very interesting, and we're hoping to persuade Alan Wone, who was the PI, to come and talk at a meeting in June next year. So, uh, lots, it's all joined up, hopefully. Uh, thank you, Vicky. So thank questions you. for Vicky. Camille. I'm in interested in one of the last points you made, which is about payment to take part yeah. in trials. Because I've been asked exactly this okay. for a study that we are currently running. It's a pharma study, which is struggling to recruit. And the sponsor has uh -huh. asked on the UKCI what we think about these potential incentivisation packages, one of which was payment for patients. And my immediate reaction was I, don't, I, find, I would find that ethically uncomfortable because it changes the nature of the dialogue. And we discussed it at our um, specialty group meeting the other day, and that was generally the feeling on the call was that most people would find uh -huh. that uncomfortable. The R&D department in the trust said, no, this is fine, happens all the time in phase one, absolutely, you don't see a problem with it. Gemma agrees with your perception, because <laughs> we discussed yeah. it last night in the car, <laughs> that actually you're investing a lot of time and effort, yeah. and some recompense puts that relationship more on an equal footing. I just find it a very interesting area, and I'm still not sure what, what, what my thoughts are about it, so interested to hear your comments. Can, can I tell you, I mean, you've just been to yeah. the States, um, Camille, what do they do in America? Do they pay patients? Uh, I, I don't know if they do routinely, but it certainly is more common practice from what I can gather. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I think Kevin. there's also a big difference between profit and mitigation of loss. Totally. And what, Absolutely. And what, and what yes. we're talking about is people actually investing in their yes. own trial. Yes. Loss of income. Yeah. Yeah. And I just remember I, I nearly went to the States and got a job with Bob Howells all those years ago. Um, but when I went across, what struck me with Baton Marathon System was that was very much based on rating scales and very much based within clinical trial settings. And often that's only the way people can actually get drugs for Parkinson's, but yes. afford for insurance purposes. So actually these guys were taking the drugs and they're happy to be part of that purely because they're having an option of something rather than nothing and then could actually not have to pay for that. So I think it's different that was very much different at the time and that very much put me off moving across there all those years ago and that's why I kind of definitely stayed here. But I don't think it's changed, I'm not sure the health system. It, it is a very different better. system, isn't it? And so that's why there's different drivers. Whenever I've spoken there, I've usually been mobbed after, the, after my talk of people wanting a third and fourth opinion. I have the same experience all over it. <laughs> um, yeah, other questions for Vicky? Not a question, just a huge thank you for yeah. sharing yeah. 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 your journey so openly and movingly with us. Yeah. Yeah. And for yeah. being honest and frank about yeah. it as yeah. well. Tom? Um, have you come across many people from uh, who are involved from an older aspects, like 80 plus, the no. more frail, no. they're massively underrepresented and yeah. how do we get them involved? Like I said, we go and physically knock on every door because I feel really passionate. There's a lot of Parkinson's patients out there who have no access to internet, no access to charity stuff, don't know what's new and yeah. current and are isolated and on their own and I think mm. we need to get out there and support them desperately. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. Something we might touch on in your talk, Amelia, because uh, there's some very good websites out there, but not everybody's on the interweb. No. And, and another issue we have, we have a very 
elderly population, uh-huh. Vicky, and, it, and I, you touched on it, but they'll mention research and we'll say you need to travel too. Yeah. And, and uh, put some off. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So we'd have to provide transport, but like I said, trial buddies who maybe can support them and literally take them hand in hand and guide them. Oh. Or look at a different model and actually yeah. have a home based clinical yeah. trial. Yeah. 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 You know, that's certainly been happening. Carly Tan has been running one in the States that looks exactly along that, that pattern mm-hmm. with the nurse going into the home to do an IV. Yeah. Uh, in level 12. Yeah. Like Actually, I haven't really thought through the travel. Right? I'm very different from you going down to Bristol from Hexham. Yeah. Compared with my patients just been down the road from Cheltenham. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, very a, different. A lot of ours are London based. And for our patients to negotiate a train, then the underground. Oh my God, yeah. Totally. And for me, there were some certain days, I don't know how I did get <coughs> home and flying home sometimes after an infusion into your brain. You feel really weak um, because you look all right, you know. Yeah. You don't always get the sympathy. All right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. All that and then having to endure EasyJet. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> but I've learned to ask for help because initially I would like it's too, a lot of pride, which is so stupid. But yeah, you don't want to be seen as having Parkinson's, but we've got it. And get, you know, no, no. So you, people are helpful if you ask. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. They That's are. True. Absolutely true. Any other questions for Vicky at this stage? Um, yeah. How how do you get people? When I see new patients, I always talk about joining the research registry if you haven't got a trial at the time. Because I always say there might be a trial coming up in the future, they might be interested in, yeah. at least it's one way of being engaged with research and seeing what's coming up. But how can we join all those dots together? Because sometimes there are other trials going on. But how can we encourage people to put their name to that and then you know, have that dialogue at the very beginning? So I think you get them to meet people who've been on trials. You get them to have trial bodies, you know, people who've been through the process. I think that's the only way somebody who's walked in those shoes already. Vicky, thank you so much. Much appreciated.